Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Tom O'Neill, and I'm a member of the risk advisory practice here at Equifax. Collectively, this team supports our clients by providing insights and guidance on how to navigate economic uncertainty and uncover hidden opportunities. My panel of experts today include the following individuals. First, we have Thomas Aliff. Tom is the the head of risk advisory practice here at Equifax. Aliff also runs a clandestine espionage operation out of his home office, bent on gathering intelligence on upcoming Purdue basketball opponents. Next, we have Jesse Harden. Jesse was formerly a llama handler in Peru before he discovered his true passion working with credit and macroeconomic data. Next, we have Dave Soika. After getting bored with the posh country club lifestyle of the Chicago streets, Dave decided to mix it up by joining corporate America, and we are the lucky recipients of that. Also, we have Maria Urtube. Maria graciously takes time out of her busy international jet set schedule each month just to join us for these podcasts. And finally, I'm Tom O'Neill. I dedicate my spare time to my goal of someday successfully merging Eastern philosophy with nonlinear mathematical optimization. Uh, It's slow, to say the least. So welcome, everyone. Happy to have you with us today. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey. Glad to be here. Today, we thought we'd go in a little bit of a different direction. Uh, We spend a lot of time in this forum and others talking about credit trends and what's going on in the economic environment. But we do so with the assumption that people listening uh, have a good understanding of why those things are important to our listeners, which, for the most part, consists of individuals working in or supporting lending institutions. Uh, And that may not be the case for everyone out there. So today we're going to shine a light on risk professionals and others who work to protect the institutions that make credit available, as well as, you know, work for those individuals and businesses that they serve. We're calling this one a day in the life of a risk professional. You know, even though we're using, quote unquote, risk professional very much as a generic title, and we know that there's no possible way that we can cover all that risk professionals do in a single 20 to 30 minute session. Uh, So if you're one of those professionals, we know that there are things that we'll need to leave out, uh, but yeah, enjoy being the hero of this podcast in the meantime. But before we begin, let's kick things off with a quick economic update from David Fieldhouse, Director of Consumer Credit Analytics at Moody's Analytics. David? The Federal Reserve is facing a delicate task of balancing monetary policy to sustain economic growth while controlling inflation. The U.S. economy has shown a lot of resilience with annualized GDP growth just under 3% last quarter, and unemployment rate is below 4%. Uh, this indicates a lot of positive prospects in the near term. You know, And we hope that there's going to be a soft landing. However, we really can't be confident of any soft landing until the Federal Reserve decides to lower interest rates. Today, the, the federal front rate is around 5.5%. And it's significantly higher than what the Federal Reserve states as the equilibrium rate, the rate that's not going to cause the economy to accelerate or decelerate too much, uh, uh, which is around 2.5%. So a 300 basis point difference there. Um, This discrepancy suggests that the current rates of the federal funds rate, that is, may be unnecessarily high and potentially restraining some type of economic growth. The Federal Reserve has been a bit reluctant to uh, lower rates. It's taken a very cautious approach, and it really wants to ensure that inflation returns to target. But this caution may also risk weakening the economy. You know, the Federal Reserve has made errors in the past. It is often perceived that in 2022, um, it delayed raising rates off of the zero bound when the uh, economy's rapid rebound from the pandemic was going on. And this delay led to a surge in inflation, forcing the Federal Reserve to increase rates aggressively. The Federal Reserve should try to take into account all the uh, factors such as employment, inflation, financial conditions when setting monetary policy to avoid such errors. Inflation, uh, while it's still above the Federal Reserve's target, has been moderating and is expected to return to target by the end of the year. However, the current 2% inflation target is being questioned given lower potential growth and interest rates compared to when the target was being adopted in the mid-1990s. A higher inflation target, such as 3%, could potentially avoid the need for a lot of quantitative easing during downturns. Despite calls for lower 
rates, the Federal Reserve is expected to proceed slowly and methodically, perhaps cutting a quarter point each quarter until the funds rate is close to R star, the equilibrium rate. This approach would likely stimulate the stock market and reduce long-term interest rates while easing pressure on the banking system. Maintaining the current 5.5% federal funds rate is becoming increasingly untenable for the Federal Reserve, which is getting very close to achieving its dual mandate of full employment uh, and low stable inflation. Uh, So we do expect a a gradual reduction in that rate over over time, and hopefully that there's no substantial delay, which would increase the chances of any type of uh, economic downturn. Thank you, David. Now, simply put, a risk professional's responsibility is to evaluate and mitigate risks for their institution in relation to that institution's strategy and risk tolerance. Now, those last couple things are important because an institution may be very risk averse and have a very conservative approach to things like growth opportunities and, and, and other operations, while another institution may have a high degree of risk tolerance in pursuit of greater opportunities. Most institutions have some degree of both, and, and the risk professional needs to implement strategies and, and continuously modify those strategies accordingly. And while it might be easy for for many of us to think about this in terms of credit lending, uh, there are other types of risks such as regulatory risks, uh, technical risks, even physical risks such as uh, branch and storage securities. But to help provide a view into this world of risk, we've decided to do a bit of a role play. And each of my colleagues here uh, will assume a different position within a typical risk organization. Jesse has the privilege of moving into the C-suite today and will be the chief risk officer within a mid-sized bank. Maria is going to be responsible for managing credit card risk as a risk manager within that same bank, while Tom is going to be a risk analyst supporting these activities. And finally, Dave is going to oversee collections you know, within that, that bank. And today, the key topic weighing on Jesse's mind is the rising levels of card delinquencies, both within the bank's portfolio as well as across the broader landscape. So, Jesse, let me start with you. Can you give a brief job description of your role as a chief risk officer? Yeah, Tom. So herding llamas is out, I guess. But I would say, in essence, risks to the business are the frontline responsibility of the chief risk officer. So CROs report to the board or uh, the CEO, and they include matters related to both financial and non-financial risks in the organization. In my job, I'd say more than half of my time then is spent really with non-financial risks, just given how the, the situation changes quickly with many of those, those types of risks. I therefore then have to rely on my frontline uh, risk managers like Maria and her teams of analysts like Tom to ensure that we're meeting expectations relating to growth and loss objectives, that we're adhering to all of the appropriate risk policy, and that we're managing the full life cycle of risk mitigation, including our collection efforts led by Dave. So with a dynamic economy like we're in, I I think there's no shortage of ways we can spend our time each day. So I really have to ensure that our our risk uh, function is, is focused in the right areas for the organization. Thanks for that. And, uh, and and you mentioned the the dynamic economy that we're in, and related to that, as we're seeing something like the the rise of delinquencies, how are you handling things like that to, uh, when changes come about? Yeah, so we've we've seen a rather quick run up in delinquency post pandemic, and it's not at record levels, but certainly it's elevated. Obviously, credit card uh, balances and delinquencies are growing, and so we see stressors in the economy, including inflation reduced savings rates and additional pressures with elevated interest rates and things like the student loan resumption. We're focusing then on delinquencies in a number of ways. First, I have to ensure personally that I understand my P&L deeply and I understand what the delinquent accounts mean for my business. And then I also have to ensure that my team of risk managers led by Maria and we have star analysts like Tom that are focused on how we manage or mitigate risk in the environment. Uh, but then also we we have to focus on the growth objectives of the bank. We just can't cut out one uh, to answer the other. And so as the delinquency rates increase and remain elevated, we know there's going to be a need for increased collection efforts as well. So I want to ensure that my collections managers are on top of the strategies, you know, that Dave's on top of, of everything that he's handling for that issue. And then finally, I have to ensure that I'm seeing the big picture. And that's communicating to our leadership and our board effectively 
as those economic stressors like delinquency continue to grow. Thanks for that, Jesse. And uh, Maria, let me let me turn the attention over to you right now. Uh, Jesse mentioned uh, as as setting the strategy and, and and reacting to what we're seeing out there. In your role as as risk manager for cards, a you know what is that that role? What is the description of that? And then how do you, you know, implement the the policies that that Jesse is referring to? Thank you, Tom. As as a risk manager for credit cards, I I own and oversee all activities pertaining to credit risk for the credit card business, and this includes uh, the comprehensive risk assessment of individual applicants' creditworthiness, as well as the overall risk profile and performance of the credit card portfolio. So I manage and lead a team of risk analysts um, and data scientists, including Tom Aleph, uh, in the credit analysis and underwriting process and develop the credit policy that aligns to the organization's risk appetite and tolerance while adhering to regulatory compliance and the industry's best practices in place. Besides, of course, meeting Jesse's requirements and goals for the business. Uh, But joke aside, an important part of my job is to track and report our champion and challenger strategies on a monthly basis at minimum and present not just our performance results to the executive team, including our CRO, CRO Jesse, and senior stakeholders, but our insights as well. And of course, address the needs that they raise for the business. Wow. So, so it's it's not just a matter of determining what the score cutoff should be and and you know calling it a day, huh? So, with with all of that, you, you laid out a pretty broad you know, landscape of different activities. What is it that that keeps you up at night, particularly now when when we're seeing things like taking delinquencies as an example? Lots of questions. How can we grow the portfolio in the current delinquency environment? How does my organization compare to the industry and to our peers? Um, How has my originated population changed over time? How are scores rank ordering? How frequently should I revisit credit strategies in place? What is our share of wallet among our customers? How can we increase card usage uh, for profitable customers? What do customers need and how these needs might change over time? How do these needs vary by segment? And how can I anticipate those changing needs to retain customers? Wow. Thank you for that, Maria. Appreciate that. Uh, Tom, you, you just heard you know, everything that's, that's on Maria's plate. Um, as a risk analyst, you know, what, what are your you know, responsibilities and how do you support everything that Jesse and Maria just went through? Yeah, sure. I think I think it's important to define this in, a, in I guess, you know, methodical way, you know, because that's the way that I operate and the way that I think, um, you know, from the standpoint when I hear when, when I'm describing an analyst role, it's taking at a granular level research that can help lead to decisions. And when we define that out, there's a lot of analysts within our teams that can be formed in the, in the marketing side or the risk side. And you know, from, from the risk standpoint, then a lot of my work in, across various roles spans all the different capacities that, that we describe. So I have many peers that are focused and honed in on the areas that Jesse and Maria, and then we'll hear from Dave as well, will describe in terms of how we do analyses to address those risks. And those can be uh, you know, things that can help grant a decision decision to make a loan. It can be uh, help us make a decision for increasing or decreasing credit line assignment. And you know, with the, the challenges that you specifically brought up, thinking about delinquencies, how can I understand like you know what we're currently doing and what is the potential impact to that across the across that spectrum? And, and it just happens to be that uh, within my current role, I'm responsible for making recommendations around credit line assignments. On that last point that you you were just making, Tom, when when you, you mentioned as as delinquencies change, it sort of pivots. How does that you know, something like increasing delinquencies or any change in your portfolio, for that matter, how does that change what you're doing and and what you prioritize? That's a that's a really good question. We do get this a lot, especially when we work with uh, you know various partners as they're looking to help us address these questions. Uh, there are very standard ways that we hold true throughout economic cycle, and so there's about you know I, I would say twelve to fifteen key characteristics that we we analyze to understand what is the total credit risk and then how would I set a line assignment and you know, you know from the from a baseline perspective if I'm thinking about a line assignment there's going to be a credit 
uh, component and a capacity component. And you know, since the the Card Act came out, uh, we've we've been able to address a lot of that through uh, income, uh, as well as you know, leveraging the various credits, uh, you know, and facilities that we've had, both from a, a score perspective. But then there's also some, uh, you know, I, I guess I would call them essential knockouts that we you know we may want to you know include uh, you know going forward as well. And so so it really just depends on how do we add or subtract from our baseline you know, to meet the goals that come down to us as an organization. And so if we know what our, you know, what is the total exposure uh, that we're trying to manage to, then it gives me a goal uh, to be able to hone in on. And I, and I guess what I would, how I would define this is within the analysis standpoint is the goals and objectives that are given to me through, uh, through our team as an organization and, and leadership team, it helps me to then have a roadmap for where I'm going to go and make the, uh, and, uh, those adjustments, you know, to, uh, to the situation. You know, think about it like I'm I'm moving on you know Google Maps or you know something like that. And I know the destination I'm going to, but along one path there might be an obstacle. I may need to take a different path or a detour. Thank you for that. Thank you all three of you uh, so far. And 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 I am going to come back to you because there's there's more that I want to find out. But before I do that, I really want to turn the attention over to Dave. Um, collections is is something that a lot of people have a, a, a strong emotional yeah reaction to. Um, yeah, they think about it purely in the negative, but it, I, my understanding is it's a lot more than that. So Dave, as, as chief collection officer, yeah, can you give us a description of, of what your role entails? Thanks, Tom. So again, I oversee the collection of our outstanding debts from our customers. Bas- very basic. But along those lines, to accomplish those goals, again, I'm responsible for developing and implementing effective strategies, policies, and procedures to minimize losses, and to maximize recoveries. I collaborate with various departments and stakeholders to improve our processes and systems. And then also, as leader of the collection side of things, my team ensures compliance with all relevant laws and regulations as we go about our day-to-day activities. So Dave, when you're talking about those activities, how static is that? Is that something that that is pretty fluid given the different you know, environments that we find ourselves in? What impacts your job the most and, and how does you know, the changing landscape change what you're focused on from a day-to-day basis? Yeah, with today's topic on delinquencies, I'm very busy. Uh, my people love this. This is where we earn our keep in the organization. Um, but I have to always keep in mind And I have to remind my people that we're seeing a small component of our overall customer base. Maria's credit card program sits at a 5% delinquency rate. That also means 95% of those cardholders are paying us on time. If I'm looking at mortgage, it might be 50 basis points of delinquency, which means 99.5% of our mortgage holders are paying on time. Yeah. And so while it's easy to get jaded on the delinquency side of things, we also have to remember the other side of things and that there are well-paying customers. The organization loves habitually delinquent customers. And what I mean by that is a 30, a customer that is habitually 30 days late earns us interest income. As long as they don't go 60, then we're not in danger of starting down the path of legal recovery or any of those types of methodologies to ensure that our debt has been repaid. And so really in these times, it's also about looking across the the organization to ensure that we're working the customer effectively across all channels and all portfolios. So while we're focused today a little bit with Maria on the card side, I know I have to also look at and see what's going on in our mortgage portfolio, what's going on in our auto portfolio. And if The customer has those relationships in addition to the one I'm collecting on. I need to work those as well to ensure that it's a one-time experience with the customer. I don't have to call them again. And we're going to, we're going to recover all delinquent accounts at the same time in the proper fashion. Fantastic. Thank thank you so much for that, Dave. That's, it's illuminating (laughs) to to hear that, that, you know, we, we tend to think of collections purely in the negative, but as you rightly point out, you know, we got to keep a, a, yeah, a, a, an eye on the fact that yeah, ninety nine point five percent of all mortgage you know, customers are in fact paying their bills on time, and even ninety five. We hear about you know card delinquencies, you know, 
going to you know to higher and higher levels but gee wouldn't you know most of the people are still paying their their bills on time and it's you know important to keep that in mind jesse let me let me go back to you when you were describing your role as as cro uh you, you covered a lot of ground you, you talked about a lot of different things yeah you know, so many areas to focus on what are some of the the biggest challenges that you face on a day-to-day basis yeah, and I would say, Tom, you know, you're getting a good good perspective of why I have these good people working for me. You know, they're showing you the capabilities that they have. That being said, I would say the biggest challenge I face as a chief risk officer right now is just how I spend my time. So it's it's you know it's not very flashy of an answer, but you know I mentioned the two broad categories of risk that we manage. We manage first the financial risks, and I would call those the things that. Um, the, the types of risks that are directly measured in our PL based on performance of the underlying asset. So you can think of things like credit risk exposure that Maria talked about, some of the credit quality and evaluation of current and future economic conditions. That's, you know, first and foremost, that's important. And obviously that's critical to the health and success of our credit portfolio. Uh, but what I find in my job is that the second category, which is that non-financial risk, it's so vast and broad you know, think of things like technology, whether it's technology innovation or it's disruption, things in uh, government and compliance and regulatory, third party issues, third party fraud issues, reputation, et cetera. All of those, um, you know, take up a, a majority really of my time. And so I have to ensure that I'm balancing um, my time and my group's time uh, appropriately and where the organization needs it. So it's critical and why I have to count on the best and brightest teams like I have, like um, analysts like Tom and frontline managers like Maria and, and Dave, uh, really so that they can focus on the, the tasks that we need as an organization to continue to, to push forward with. And, you know, as we deviate from that, if we, you know, if we lose track of what's important, that's when we, uh, we have issues. And we've seen some of that transpire last year with other organizations, you know, other banking organizations, maybe taking their eye a little bit off of the the key focus and risk. Thank you for that, Jesse. And uh, speaking of the, the best and brightest that you were referencing, uh, Maria, let me go back to you. You, when you were giving a description of, of your role as, as risk manager, you, you, you covered a, a lot, you know, not just strategy development, but also, you know, the deployment of that, the monitoring, the reporting and so forth. What what are your go to competitive advantages that that help you with these various challenges that you face? Tom, uh, data analytics and technology are constantly evolving, but are at, are at the center of my everyday activities and those of my team. Uh, data sources and models, including origination, behavior, collection models, for example, that Dave and his team rely on, uh, that provide a competitive edge over what I already have or can develop in-house. Uh, if I'm expanding into new markets or evaluating cross-selling opportunities for my current customers, uh, off us information on these individuals, such as the depth of their career credit experience or products held with other institutions, uh, of course, current and historic delinquency trends. Another aspect would be um, non-traditional credit information and access to that type of source uh, for these profiles, particularly for those with limited credit information. I would say, in general, levers that will enable improved uh, data-driven decisions and platforms that facilitate as much as possible more efficient, uh, integrated, and automated responses in, in the credit life cycle. So, so not much, huh? So, Mr. Aliff, uh, as a risk analyst, yeah, the, the name kind of entails you know, a very analytic yeah, <laughs> and quantitative of focus. Um, but how much of your job is, is purely analytic and, and data science driven? And how much requires a solid in, uh, understanding of the industry that you work in and, and specifically your organizational uh, objectives? I think it's critically important, whether it's within my, my own capacity 
or a partner capacity with other team members, uh, because not everyone can have like the I guess a focus of understanding the business as well as the uh, the data science. I think they are both equally important though in the way that I would describe it. Because if we're doing analyses, when I describe the Google Maps scenario, if we don't know where we're going, it's very easy to to, uh, to determine a path that isn't aligned with the objective, uh, and and that's a very easy way that we can go. You know, there's a lot of uh, talk around you know letting the machine drive with uh, you know, artificial intelligence or whatever, but it's very important to ensure that whoever is in charge of that or driving it is incorporating the things that uh, are uh, that we need to think about from the, the current environment. And so, as delinquencies are rising, I guess the ways that I would you know think about that is there's absolutely data driven capacities that I can incorporate and overlay to be able to set those strategies. But you know, I I, I also know that uh, you know, from some analyses that uh, that I received from Equifax that uh, if uh, you know some Someone has a delinquency on their automobile, uh, they are 10 times more likely to go delinquent on their card the next month. And so within that population, that would that is a combined effort to know there was a massive amount of data science that went into it, and there was a business implication that I can incorporate, and I can set a strategy using that information. Thank you for that, Tom. Dave, don't want to leave you out here, especially because when, when you were describing your role, you, uh, you brought up a, a lot of, you know, I think unique perspectives that that a lot of people don't think about when uh, when when thinking about collections and purely the negative aspect of it, um, and, and you talked about you know, balancing that with the uh, with that whole customer uh, relationship standpoint. So, let me ask you: How do you do that? How do you balance supporting the business versus serving your customers? Great question, and those are are, are not mutually exclusive. As we, as I interact with our customers, I'm also fulfilling the goals and, and targets of the organization. And what I mean by that is, obviously, we've got certain revenue goals. We've got certain loss goals. We've got certain NPI, uh, net promoter, you know, NPS score, net promoter score targets that we want. And as being the the one of this organization that actually works and talks to our customers, it's important that I manage that experience accordingly. We talked about the 95% that are paying. We talked about you know the 99.5% that are paying. But even within that 50 basis point mortgage or the 5% credit card, there are those customers that have been with us a long time. There are those customers that have multiple relationships with us that drive a lot of revenue through the, you know, through deposits again, and, and various other relationships with us. Those are important to keep in mind. And as I'm looking at recovering on their debt, I need to make sure that my strategy, my interactions with those customers meets the appropriate level of effort. And what I mean by that is there are some customers who, again, Oh, they moved. They didn't get the mail and up oh, my, my, payment date doesn't correspond with my uh, payroll uh, deposit. So I'm always going to be a little bit late. And it's understanding that those those uh, customers will pay on time. They'll, they'll, they won't pay on time, but they'll pay. And I don't need to call them. I don't need to send them a letter. And then there are those bad actors who took out that loan and they have no desire to pay us. Uh, they might have the capacity, but an unwillingness to pay. They might not, they might be a, a newer customer. They might be an existing customer, but they're not the type of relationship that we want to maintain. And it's up to me to, you know, to end that relationship in an appropriate fashion, going back to following rules and guidelines set, you know, set forth, uh, by the, you know, by the various agencies that, that, uh, you know, keep track of these things. And so through that experience, um, making, you know, making each interaction with us as, as pleasant as possible. And again, getting a call from a collector is never a pleasant response, you know, a, a pleasant experience. But again, if we can make it as pleasant as possible and strengthen the relationship with the customer, you know, there might be benefits down the road, which ultimately benefit the organization. And the customer for that matter, I would imagine. I, that's, that's a very refreshing take to, to hear you know, that it's not just a matter of, uh, yeah, you know, working the queue and seeing how much you know, you know, dollars at risk we could we could save. You know, but it's actually working those relationships and and potentially with some of them. You know, 
helping those customers. And, and, you know, at the, the end of the day, it's actually a stronger relationship than it was, you know, going into it, uh, which is uh, not something that that many people think about when, uh, when considering. I will call this a wrap. I would like to thank Maria, uh, Thomas, Dave, and Jesse for joining me today. To our listeners, I hope you enjoyed today's topic. We were a, a bit different from our, our normal run of things today. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for future podcasts, please reach out to us at riskadvisors at equifax.com. And to all of you, thank you very much for joining us. And everyone, have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, team. Thank you. Bye-bye. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at Equifax.com.